good to see everyone here this evening. Um, we're going to get started right on time tonight and uh, I invite you to stand and pray with me this evening. Good to have Aunt Carol Koenig with us. God bless you. Um, from, is it Oregon City? Is it, or, is it Oregon City? Yeah. So um, we're just so delighted to have you with us. And thanks for being here tonight. Um, we want to remember... Um, Sharitha Johnson uh, she was in the rehab facility from uh, recovering from her stroke and uh, we prayed uh, for her God was doing great things well she got out today into the hallway well before you say amen she got out of her room today navigating and she fell um, and uh, bumped her head and so she's okay um, she's back at the rehab center now we just want to pray for Sister Aretha Johnson and the Johnson family tonight asking the Lord to be uh, with her. Pray for uh, Pastor Doty. He's not feeling well uh, tonight. Pray for Paul Doty and his family. They are not feeling well tonight. Anyone else need prayer? Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Worley. Well, let's pray together. Also tonight, um, as we pray, we're going to remember our Friends Day coming up um, this weekend. Uh, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, we have Pastor Gary Legg coming uh, to speak. But we just want to pray that God would uh, bless the invitation efforts and the outreach efforts. And bless Brother um, Legg as he's speaking. And just have the Lord use him in prophecy and in faith building. Pray for the service and pray for every visitor that's going to be coming here this coming Sunday. Let's pray together, shall we? Jesus, we thank you for your many, many blessings in our life. We thank you for being Lord of all, King of kings and Lord of lords. We honor you today. You are a precious Savior and our great God that heals us and strengthens and delivers. Lord, it is our privilege tonight to come before you and to uh, worship you and to set our hearts upon you and to open your word together, Lord, and to uh, look into the perfect law of liberty together tonight. We're asking for your blessings as we journey through tonight's lesson. We're asking, God, also tonight that you would touch those in need of healing and strength and comfort. Uh, Lord, many names and many issues and physical needs of healings and miracles, God. And we pray for Christina. We pray for the Worley family. We pray for Melinda Egan and uh, Pastor Doty and Paul Doty, God. We pray for Aretha Johnson tonight. We pray for my mother, Marsha Anthony, God. Let your healing virtue continue to strengthen and lift and keep, Lord. We pray for um, uh, Calvin and Alice Jewett tonight. We pray that you would be with them and help their bodies to be healed and strengthened. We thank you, God, for your ever-present help in the time of our need. We pray, God, together tonight for Friends Day, Lord, a time when we are focusing our hearts on uh, a need for a move of the Holy Spirit of God in our city and in our friends and in our uh, fellow employees and our neighbors, God. There's been a lot of invitations, God, been given out. You see everyone. And Lord, you know our hearts. We know that we can't change one person. And that there's nothing about this church, Lord God, as far as music or color or, Lord, while we're great people, that's not what changed us. Uh, you have changed us by your Spirit. I'm asking for a mighty move of your Spirit to move upon those that have been invited, Father, that you would just draw them. Uh, with your presence Lord and then on Sunday when we come together let the people of God bring their faith not their faith in again we as people but faith in you Lord God to do what we cannot do to impact people in such a way as to transform their life 
to give them hope and to give them life and to give them strength and to save their soul. I thank you, Lord. I'm asking you, God, let your spirit begin and continue to move in this endeavor. Be with our uh, Pastor Gary Legg today as he is preparing and setting his heart upon the message. I pray that you would divinely uh, uh, direct his thoughts, that his words would be words uh, from the throne of heaven on Sunday. I thank you, Lord. God, this is not a small thing but you are in the business of reaching and saving people. And I pray that you would use this congregation, Lord, as tools in your hands to draw people to your presence where we can collectively worship together your greatness. Thank you for this opportunity, and we don't take it for granted. We honor you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. You can be seated. have several announcements today. I am going to be showing a lot of videos, so... If you can't see the screen, I encourage you to uh, position yourself in such a way that you could. Um, uh, Friends Day this coming Saturday, uh, I mean this coming Sunday, uh, Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Uh, just, just excited about that. Uh, be in prayer for that. Uh, if you haven't fasted yet, fast a meal, fast a day for that special service. Also, I have um, put on the uh, Get Involved wall, Adopt a Mulch Bed. I don't know if you understand the language or not. Uh, throughout the spring and the summer, uh, we have several different mulch beds around the building. And uh, just wanted to know if there was someone who would like to uh, take responsibility for a particular area. Pulling weeds, getting the mulch, herding the mulch back up into the mulch bed. Uh, and just kind of taking care of that. If that's something that you would like to do, you can see me, and uh, we'll get you squared away. And we appreciate the help and uh, and facilitate you in any way possible. There's a lost and found in the uh, table in the coat room. Um, this will be gone uh, by this Sunday, April the second. So if you've lost anything, uh, stop by there and see if it might have found its way there, and claim it as your own. Also, Easter drama, Blameless. You should have seen it on the sign as you drove up tonight. Um, Blameless is the Easter drama that we're having, and that Easter is April the 16th. This year we're doing something that I don't believe we've, we've done uh, as of yet. We're having an Easter drama performance on Saturday night at 6 o'clock. Saturday night at 6 o'clock, and then Sunday morning at 10 a.m. We will not have service on Sunday evening. And so we have two... Uh, services Saturday at 6 Sunday at 10 a.m. Um, I also want to put a plug in to uh, for the uh, nursery workers um, we do have some that have volunteered for Saturday p.m. Um, we don't really know how many people are going to be showing up for this um, we could have a lot we could have a little um, but we want to be ready so if you're willing to be on a backup list for Saturday um, Sister Eichenberg is right over here. Uh, nursery is always a huge, huge ministry for us here. Uh, and Saturday night's performance should be about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, and then on Sunday morning as well, if you're able to come on Saturday night and view it, then you're willing to come and volunteer on Sunday morning for ministry. Uh, again, we're going to do the play again, uh, the drama again. Uh, we are needing at least two people uh, for Sunday morning. So if, you're not, if you don't have a part in the play uh, and you would like to get involved in ministry, we need your help. Sunday morning is generally a really packed time. Um, and uh, so if you're not in the play, make sure you can uh, see uh, one of the performances. We want you to enjoy that. But we also need to solicit your help in volunteering and helping in the nursery ministry. Thank you. Uh, you should have had an opportunity to give by now uh, unto the Lord. Also, did you receive a handout? Amen. Very good. Very good. We're continuing our journey uh, through the Dead Sea, uh, through the Israel journey through Israel. Uh, we're going to be covering the the area of the Dead Sea. But I wanted to show you a couple of pictures um, before uh, this was uh, on my uh, eleven hour journey on the plane. Um, I took a snapshot of my apartment. It was very roomy and spacious. 
And then featured in this photo is the back of Dan Matthews' head. And I wanted to show you there were lots of leg room. Lots of leg room. My knees were up against that. If anyone has ever traveled overseas or even in an airplane, you know that uh, they don't, uh, they're not real generous with the space on the plane. And then uh, on this particular one, um, this was, I believe, on a Wednesday. Uh, it was a little cold outside, so we had a break. So we ran in to a coffee shop to get um, coffee. And so all of us Americans are running in, and the barista asked me, uh, what size would you like? And I said, venti, large, grande, whatever, however you say it. He said, lungi. And I said, sure, is that the biggest thing you got? And he said, yes. I'm, so I'm thinking cup. And he comes out and he hands me this. And I paid as much for that as it did a venti, you know, at, at Starbucks. And I'm like, wow. So I had to take a picture of that. I had Baron take a picture of that and said that. That was a jaw drop moment for me in Israel. And, and quite honestly, uh, that's about the size it gets. It, you don't get these large, super size American cup of coffee, coffee over there. And it is very strong, I will say. It is, it is pretty strong. I don't know if they added any cream or anything to it. So I was awake for five days. Um, so those are some fun, fun times, and I want to share those with you. The, the uh, area of our focus is um, this part of Israel. Uh, just almost the, the um, eastern border there, uh, called the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea. How many have heard of the Dead Sea before? It's, uh, it's uh, all often been preached on and taught on as, as uh, at least growing up, I always heard about it as, you know, you don't want to be like the Dead Sea because it receives, but it doesn't give anything out and nothing grows there. So they use that as a spiritual thing typology for us that if all you do is receive and you never become a conduit to someone or something else then uh, you're going to have you're going to be full of dead things or nothing's going to grow in you and I want to grow about you I want I want to grow in God and so uh, man freely I've received so much from the Lord I want to be a uh, free giver of what God has given to me but the Dead Sea is also known as the Salt Sea and I want to read a, a, a scripture here, Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 10. The Bible talks about, uh, or the prophet Ezekiel prophesies about uh, the Dead Sea. So I want to read that to you today uh, in your hearing, Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 10. It shall come to pass that everything that liveth which moveth whithersoever the river shall come, shall live, and there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand, this is verse, uh, verse 10, the fishers shall stand upon it from En Gedi, and that's a place that I'll introduce you to, but it is a oasis on the west side, right about the middle of the Dead Sea. And Gedi unto, uh, uh, unto upon it, from En Gedi even unto Egelam, they shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds as the fish of the Great Sea, which is referencing the Mediterranean Sea, exceeding many. And so the prophecy of Ezekiel states that people are going to be able to fish from the banks of the Dead Sea and catch fish. And so that's a pretty amazing uh, prophecy. Even uh, one of the tour guides in 2005 uh, said that, yeah, the prophecy states that there's going to be fish uh, in here. Uh, but in order to do that, somehow uh, you've got to connect the Dead Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and, and so the Lord has a great way of doing that. Um, and there's a couple other prophecies. However, I thought it was very interesting that it talked about the Dead Sea here in Ezekiel chapter 47. The Dead Sea is a salt lake bordered by Jordan. This is in your notes. East and Israel, Palestine to the west. 
its surface and shores are 1,412 feet below sea level. It's the Earth's lowest, uh, lowest elevation. Uh, the Dead Sea is 997 feet deep, which makes it the deepest um, of the saline lakes in the world. It is 34 plus or minus percent uh, salt is the, the uh, ratio there. Uh, if you go to the ocean, um, depending on where you measure it, it could be, uh, you know, six, seven, eight percent, so, or even a little under that. So this is nine to ten times more salty than the ocean. So because of that, the density of this incredible uh, Dead Sea or lake um, uh, is such that you are buoyant when you get into it. So. Uh, as we look through some of these pictures, we've got a lot of pictures to show you tonight. They say that a picture's worth a thousand words, and so you're not going to hear a lot from me tonight because I have 154 slides to show you. And so that's 154,000 words you're going to get in one hour. But uh, what you're looking at here as we look through these is um, uh, you're looking at the, the yonder shore. Uh, which could be Jordan and or the ancient land of Moab. Anybody ever heard of Moab? So this is the land of Moab and the Moabites. And so um, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, would have went over into Moab, lost her sons and her husband, and then come back with one daughter-in-law named Ruth. So uh, we actually were able to stop here uh, and uh, uh, float in the Dead Sea so we were having a lot of fun just by looking at the the Dead Sea you w can't really tell uh, that it's that salty uh, along the edges you see a little bit of a white crust or crystallization but other than that uh, you really can't tell the difference should see some pictures of uh, Baron and myself entering into the water um, for our Dead Sea float. It was quite amazing. Everything I've ever learned about water. There we are. Our hands up in the air. Is uh, you know it's wet. Yes, um, uh, but you absolutely do not sink. You just you do not sink. Um, you can roll over onto your stomach, and when you do that, it really puts a lot of pressure for your face to go down for some reason uh, into the water. So you really got to arch your back just to keep your head out of the water. They said in 2010, they had about 20 uh, people drown in the Dead Sea because of that weird phenomenon that happens when you get rolled over on your belly. And if you're out too deep um, and you get a mouthful of that stuff, it'd probably take you down pretty quick. But So we had a wonderful time. Uh, floating. It was relatively cold. I think it was like 43 degrees uh, outside, so it was, it was really cold. And so we didn't stay out of the water very long, and there I am afterwards heading back to our hotel. Um, so I had a wonderful time at the Dead Sea. A couple of the notes about the Dead Sea, it's there in your notes. Um, uh, uh, a lot of products, varying products. It's one of the world's first health resorts uh, for Herod the Great. He often resorted here uh, so history says and it's been the supplier of a wide variety of products from asphalt for Egyptian mummification to potash for fertilizers people also use the salt and minerals from the Dead Sea to create cosmetics and herbal scents and so forth so Ahava is a is a, a lotion producing plant that is there and so when I go the last couple times I've been able to bring home some Ahava lotion um, for my wife and a few gifts so uh, really good stuff really nice stuff so the Dead Sea was an incredible time for us um, experience. Um, as we uh, go through the next section of slides we are point number two or place number two on on this map here is is called the uh, Qumran Caves how many have heard of the Qumran Caves before now um, before you go to the next one you'll see a little settlement right here this is the latest archaeological digs uh, that they have uncovered of the sect of uh, Jewish 
uh, men that, inter uh, that wrote scriptures. And so they've uncovered this little camp at the foothills here. Um, uh, and this is just right at the northwest edge of the Dead Sea. Uh, quite some interesting facts. It's, it's a, about one mile again, northwest shore of the Dead Sea. But one of the interesting facts that I wanted to bring to you about this place as they're scrolling through some of those is in 1946, two Bedouin shepherds, uh, Bedouin is kind of nomads, um, they, were, they were watching some sheep and uh, one of them fell into a cave. <laughs> in fact, um, that cave right there, that's the, that's the first cave um, that was um, discovered. Uh, they knew they were there, but no one had ever really went in there. So these better ones in 1946, one of the brothers fell in there. And in there they found, uh, in that cave, uh, pottery. And they opened it up. And inside were scrolls, ancient uh, spiritual scrolls. And they didn't know what they found. They were trying to get rid of them and make money. They said, well, what is this? And so they took it to Jerusalem and tried to sell them and, and all these different things. Quite a story, uh, so it's told. Um, and I think they finally sold it to uh, some guy for like 29 bucks, U.S. dollars. Can you imagine finding, uh, uh, it was the book of Isaiah in that first find. They found the book of Isaiah in a jar and they wanted to sell it for 29 bucks. I'll buy it. Right? Uh, they also found part of the book of Habakkuk. In this first find, they found three uh, different real ancient texts. Now, um, I had this dub moment about Dead Sea Scrolls because I really didn't know really what that was. And, and so I, I'm going to reveal my ignorance here today. Um, that the Dead Sea Scrolls are called the Dead Sea Scrolls because it's by the Dead Sea. Did a light bulb go on for any of you, or was that just me? Wow. I was always thinking that it was some kind of a, a deeper understanding, but they're called the Dead Sea Scrolls because they were right there. But the scrolls themselves were scrolls of ancient texts, of the books of the Bible that we hold in other community rules of the ancient Hebrew faith. And so he's probably already passed several of these, but there were just, there were actually, there are caves all around this area. Uh, and uh, as you look up into the hills, they'll, they'll zoom in and there's another cave that they'll see. But they found, uh, once they found this one and they identified what it was, they began to search, as you can imagine, all of the caves in that area. Evidently, this Qumran area in that base camp, they would actually uh, write scriptures, and then whenever they were about to be uh, overtaken by the Roman army, they would run and bury these things up in the caves, hoping to preserve them before they were taken off. So um, just th that right there, pause right there. This is cave number four. They've numbered these things. They've numbered these things. Uh, and this is cave number four. Uh, you could actually walk right down up there and there's some stairs that would kind of slide down in there uh, cave number four is significant because they found 90 percent of all the scrolls in cave number four and they found over 900 scrolls out of the 12 caves this was huge for uh, the the Jewish faith and even the Christian community and this is 1946 because it validated that what we had been believing from the uh, from, from the Hebrew um, the name escapes me uh, uh, writers and, and, and those the high priests or those that were over that we were just accepting that hey the canonization is there but the proof of the Dead Sea Scrolls we found things that predated somebody just saying hey this is the Holy Scripture and so it validated the Word of God and what we had. Now, much of the, what they found of the Dead Sea Scrolls were, were um, leaning toward the Septuagint or the Greek translation and different things of that nature. Um, but nonetheless, it was a huge archaeological find for faith in the Word of God. 
So this is a huge thing. The Dead Sea Scrolls was a huge find that validated the Word of God. That's what you need to remember about this. And so um, these quorum caves, as they, as they continue to, again, just caves everywhere. Is that the last picture, Dan? Okay. Um, they have, they found parts of every book. This is in your notes. I thought this was very important. In these 900 scrolls, they found parts of every book of the Old Testament with the exception of the book of Esther. Uh, and there's an explanation. You can go on Wikipedia and find the different things about that. Find out why the book of Esther, they, they are uh, surmising as to why uh, the, the book of Esther is not located in there. Uh, it was only later after their finding of these Dead Sea Scrolls that um, they uncovered this city and began to find out that, hey, this might have been at the, you know, these caves were at the foot of a place where they were ritualistic about writing the scriptures and how meticulous they were about transcribing the word of God. Uh, they, they would, uh, it is said that they were so meticulous, obviously sometimes they wouldn't, write, they wouldn't write vows, they wouldn't write the name of God, all these different things come into play, but one of the awesome uh, things that I just recently found out was that if one of the papers become too smudged to be able to read, they would ceremonially bury it and get it away because they didn't want anybody to get a copy of the scriptures that was incomplete or could be misinterpreted or misread uh, as it was. And so they were very, very meticulous in copying uh, the, the scriptures down. So that's the Qumran Caves. Um, the next place we went to is En Gedi, and it is an oasis in First Samuel chapter 23 verse 29 uh, says, and David went up from thence and dwelt in strongholds at En Gedi. So En Gedi is uh, uh, just a, a neat little paradise oasis, palm trees and uh, uh, everything. The setting for 1 Samuel is David is running from Saul. Saul is trying to kill David. And so David escapes to this place called En Gedi. And there he hides out in caves. And in, in the latter part, or the first part, um, I think I put it in your notes, in verse 24, uh, 1 Samuel 24, I want to read that to you. 1 Samuel 24. Verse 1, it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. So En Gedi is actually um, a name meaning the spring of the kid goat. That's in your notes. It's, it's, and Gedi is the spring of the kid goat. And it's been known for the ibexes that are there. And they're still there to this day. You'll see some of them. We pass right by them. A little bitty old deer, uh, real small sized deer. Um, so Saul uh, was chasing David, and he came to the sheep coats, by the way, uh, where was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And so uh, this story happened in and Getty. And so as we look through some of these uh, pictures today, um, we just wanted you to see uh, some of En Gedi, a place of palm trees. Natural springs feed this. There's an ibex. They're, they're not very skittish. They must be okay with Americans. Very beautiful, picturesque. It's very arid out there. 
uh, this was kind of the first place we came to. That stream was falling down there, and, and they said, oh, you can drink from the water. It's very, very clean. And uh, so sure enough, we get down there and drink some water and try to get as close to the waterfall as we can. It just In the area that we were at, you would just wind your way back up through this natural uh, valley, uh, and there was three sets of waterfalls uh, that we kind of hiked to. Um, and um, uh, the first one was there, and then we come a little further and went to the second. I believe Dan Matthews was uh, getting really, really uh, uh, motivated, and he went on ahead of the group. And he was almost to um, the third waterfall. Uh, and, uh, but the guide said, hey, don't go any further than waterfall two. And I'm like, Dan's already, you know, halfway to waterfall three. So I ran up ahead and I caught him. He turned and I says, really? Oh. So he turns around. Well, it turned out that we did go to uh, waterfall number three. And you had, I mean, it was a trek. And um, Dan said, I'm not going back. He said, it, we missed opportunity. So uh, we had a lot of fun there climbing around on rocks. And There's the final waterfall back in there. Again, they don't know, obviously, which cave David would have crawled in. It might be covered up by now. But this was En Gedi. This is the area where Saul was chasing David. And this is a, also where uh, the Bible says that they would fish and catch uh, fish on the Dead Sea from En Gedi. So we're standing right here in the place where the biblical prophecy has yet to be fulfilled. Just caves. As you looked up, you would just see holes just sporadically and you oh I wish I could go get in but there's no way up there I don't know either the mountain that eroded or um, you know the way in was undiscovered at least to Americans that were there just a very beautiful picturesque area there in En Gedi green because of the fresh water you didn't think necessarily, I mean, you could look at the boulders and know that you were in the mountainous area, but there was some green there. So it was very, very picturesque. All right, the fourth place I want to take you, a lot of pictures, right? The fourth place I want to take you tonight is to a place called Masada. Masada is located at the uh, southern edge of the western edge of the Dead Sea. And uh, Masada... Uh, is was originally built by Herod the Great. Now, it's a plateau-looking area. Uh, it's a national park now. But Herod the Great, around, you know, 4, 3, you know, even maybe uh, 5 uh, BCE uh, or BC, Herod the Great was in that area. Um, and he was the one also that was chasing after baby Jesus, trying to kill him. Um, and so he would resort here. He built this on top of this plateau. Uh, beautiful, beautiful plateau. Um, I believe it was like probably 13 or 1400 feet uh, high. Uh, and uh, so Herod the Great built it. Well, uh, in the turn of the century, uh, there, were, um, there were some revolts against Jewish uh, in 60 uh, AD. Um, there was a revolt. So hold on a second. I'll show you some of this here. This is Masada, this plateau right here. It's just a lone peak and with pretty sharp sides. Um, and they had a cable car that would take you up. Or you could walk the snake path. And so there's Baron and I. Uh, we're going to start the trek up the mountain. Uh, and there we are right there. If you could zoom in, um, you would see that that is Baron and I. I didn't know that until Baron told me. He said, yeah, you can see us. And so that's really cool. But that thing just snakes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It took us about 30 minutes to, to get all the way up. And we were moving. Uh, and so you see some people coming down. Not many people were going up. Most people were coming down. 
Um, beautiful, uh, beautiful picture at the top. This is as we're going up, and as we get higher and higher, the, just the pictures became so incredible. There's the little station um, down there where we started, and you could see people just snaking back and forth. So we're about three quarters of the way up here at this point. Um, go, can you go back a slide? I want to show you right here um, is a little square um, mound hill that they have excavated. Um, in 63 AD, uh, the Sicarii was a, a, a Jewish sect that revolted against Roman rule. And they rose up. And this is right about 70 AD when Titus came in and totally obliterated Jerusalem. Uh, and so what happened was the Sicarii sect um, stood up in an uprising against the Romans, killed some Romans, and then they fled. And they fled to Masada. And they ran to this mountaintop. It was a wonderful place that at that time there was only one way in. You had to go through a very narrow place. And you had to almost single file go through this pass. Well, if you're an army, I can pick off one at a time. I just can't pick off 3,000 at a time. And so the Sakari revolt fled to this mountaintop. And they could see all the way around them. Well... Uh, Rome decided to go get them and to squash the rebellion in about 73 uh, AD. And that, that what they found was a Roman encampment. That, that was one position that they built an encampment. And you'll see them as we get on top. You will see that all around that, all around that mountain base you would see Roman forts. Or that would be you know, an outpost of some sort to surround and to besiege that mountain so that no one could come in and no one could come out. And so that's the significance of that. And you'll see more. I'll point them out as we go through. And so uh, we, we finished our path and actually got to the top of Masada. There's a few more pictures here. There was a massive uh, water, uh, a massive uh, rain that was coming through just it would have been to the north of us and they were so afraid um, because they say uh, something about the the soil uh, soaks up water real fast or doesn't soak up water at all and so it becomes like a slip and slide and when it rains it can be flash flood and I I didn't really understand the seriousness or severity but the guy, our guide he said well I'm really nervous and I'm like, come on, a little rain cloud. What's up with that? But he said, no, you don't understand. We are so low. All the water comes here. So if you get a massive amount of rain, water can really, really uh, become a problem. And uh, so he was really, 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 really nervous about um, the rainfall the whole day. This is, again, looking back down at, at that initial station where we arrived. Um, we make our way through some more of these. Now, this is on top of Masada. Um, we have just several pictures. There was a, just a wall, a double wall. Right here was a quarry um, that they didn't haul or pack all of the rocks or the stones up the mountain. They simply dug a hole and got all the rock and built it from on top. Pretty smart. Again, fairly flat on top. Um, here's some more of the ruins and the, and, and the buildings that they have ex excavated. Herod's palace is here. There's like two or three different levels, and you'll see some of those levels as we continue to go through. You'd be, be looking on these photographs for a black line about halfway up some of these walls. All the way around, uh, if you looked closely, you would see a black or a painted line or some kind of a designation. Um, this uh, was referencing uh, what they found when they originally got up there. And then they added on the wall, but they put this little watermark saying this is exactly where the building was. We did not put that there. That is original. <clears throat> I 
there's one of his palace outlooks there. Um, Herod's palace outlooks, really beautiful. They had a water cistern that they could get water there. See that black line right there coming around the corner? That just would, would go all the way to the corner. So that was actually what was there. They added to that uh, to add effect um, so that when you walk through, you kind of get a feel for what it was like. There's that same line going down through that area. There it is again here. Again, just the walls and, and buildings and all kinds of little ins and outs and, uh, that you could see. Amazing that, you know, that's a couple thousand years old that you're walking up there and there's a couple thousand years old. Um, so, uh, back to the story of Masada. It's not known necessarily for Herod the Great in, in Jewish history. It's known for this revolt group that came up the mountain t- to run from the Romans. And um, when they got up here, the Romans encircled the city and besieged it. But there was no way for the Romans to get up to the city. And so uh, what they decided to do was to build a bridge on the west side of this plateau. Oh, I got I to gotta show this bird. Dan, did you take this picture of this black bird? I thought it was awesome. He just was sitting there looking at you. There he is. How close were you to that bird? Did he peck you on the nose? Yeah, yeah. He's just sitting there. Okay, so now we're going to walk a little bit slower through these. This is on the west side as you looked over that drop off that cliff. This was the main base right here, and it zoomed in. He zoomed, used a zoom in lens to get really close. Uh, go to another, another uh, photograph. Now, right here is what remains of the bridge uh, that the Romans constructed. I mean, it was a valley. If you can imagine, it was Sharp Valley. So in order for them to crush the rebellion, they had to encircle this Masada. And then they had to fill in an area so they could run a tower with a battering ram up it. And so the, the, the uh, historian Josephus and the historians say that when uh, they, they were building this, uh, the uh, Sirakis would throw rocks over the edge and kill. So they started using Jewish people that they had captured to build this bridge, this earth bridge, to get up there. So they stopped throwing rocks because they didn't want to kill them. They knew ultimately that we're going to die. Um, this was the, the, uh, the realization that was setting in. And so, um, again, here's, this is, uh, again, part of that bridge that's come down here. A lot of this has changed. And you could actually walk instead of taking the snake path. I didn't know this in 05. None of this was here. But in, the, in those years uh, between 05 and um, uh, 17, uh, they've actually made a walking path. So that's the quick way to, if you wanted to walk up the mountain and it's not quite as high to get up. Um, but there's that camp again. And then that, that natural bridge is right over here to the right. And so they worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. And finally, uh, they were able to uh, finish construction of the bridge. And um, is there one more picture like that? There it is. There's that bridge again. And you can see some people walking up it. But it's, it's a pretty, pretty steep little uh, bridge. Several pictures of that. There it is on that side. You can see a big group of people walking up. There's some buses and a parking lot down here. But they've made it really, really easy to walk up this mountain from this side. So this is, this is just some views from the very top of, of it. So as we're finishing up some of those, the, the end of the story of Masada is, is that um, they, uh, the Roman uh, garrison was going to go in that night, and they decided we're going to go in in the morning. Um, and the Sicarius knew that, that their time had come. And, and so Josephus records two motivating speeches uh, from the leader of this revolt group that he told to 960 people uh, of men, women, and children. 
Uh, and his plan was, I don't want you to fall into the hands of Romans because they are going to devastate you. They, Romans were not nice. Uh, they were going to squash the rebellion. And uh, so this leader of the Sicarii uh, uprising um, persuaded 960, almost 960 people, uh, to commit suicide on top of Masada. Um, they would, you know, there's a movie that they show at the bottom of this. Uh, it's very moving. It's very solemn. They say, hey, no flash photography. Don't be laughing. Don't be playing because it's a very hallowed uh, spot in commemorating uh, the stand of a Jewish uh, people. Um, and uh, so the next morning, uh, the Romans bust down with that. They're thinking, rah, we've got them, only to come in to find that the buildings had burned down to the ground. And there were only uh, uh, a total of five between women and children that were alive, but all the rest of them had, had committed suicide uh, there on the top of Masada. And so it's, it's, uh, it's a very special place uh, for the Hebrew people. In fact, our, our guide said everybody has to come here. It's kind of like their Gettysburg. It's kind of like one of those places where they say, hey, this is uh, huge for us. And so that's the story of Masada. And I got the T-shirt. It says, I climbed Masada. That's why my wife says, you're going to wear that tonight? I said, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but uh, had a wonderful time. Uh, again, it was just a privilege and an honor uh, to be able to uh, make that uh, make that journey. Any questions tonight? That's that's 151 slides. 151 slides. Uh, any questions? I'm not sure that I could answer them, but I would for sure entertain a couple of questions about the yes, sir. Unbelievable ingenuity. Uh, uh, when we get back uh, next week, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, the Western Wall, and we get to go down uh, into the tunnels next to the Western Wall. Uh, these rocks, um, stones that they hand carved and transported, and set in place meticulously are so big. I don't even know even systems today um, would, would have very few of them would be able to do what they did by uh, ingenuity, a rope, a pulley, and, you know, 5,000 slaves. It just, it's just unreal uh, how they built. And it is, an, it is a land of stones. I, I promise you that, just stones. If you're going to farm... Uh, by every farm. I wish I would have taken a picture. Maybe I, I could find some for you. But um, if you wanted to farm an acre, you drive by that acre and you will see piles of stones just piled up. It's not because they wanted to protect it. It's because they couldn't farm it until they would prepare the soil. And uh, so that really rings true to me when Jesus says, man, a sower goes forth to sow. Man, there's some stones in there. You've got to pull the stones out. Um, Otherwise, you know, don't get very much to grow. When the sun hits it, it's going to die. And so tr how true it is. So true. Uh, well said, Lord. Well said. In the land of rocks. Unreal how many rocks there are. Any other question? Fantastic. Very, very good. Uh, again, there wasn't a whole lot of Bible. Uh, I, I, I do uh, appreciate you um, looking at some of these things and uh, uh, one of the most fascinating things about this as I studied and wanted to prepare was the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, oh, I did want to tell you, um, in En Gedi, which, you know, you have the Qumran, and then you have En Gedi, and then you have Masada. So at En Gedi in 1970, uh, they found a synagogue. They uncovered a synagogue. And when they began to uncover it, they found another jar. And inside the jar uh, was... Leviticus, parts and fragments of the book of Leviticus. Uh, and it was even a more significant find than the Dead Sea Scrolls, not in the amount that they found, 
but the date and the style of the writing dated back to the Masoretic text, which was earlier uh, Hebrew writers and scholars written. And so, I mean, uh, it was dated back to the time of Jesus Christ, literally into Jesus Christ. And so, uh, in the Hebrew text, uh, was not written in the Septuagint. It was written in the original Hebrew language, which would have been what was been uh, shared that we, you know, pull our translations from and different things like that. But man, I tell you, it it was it was such an incredible find. They had to use all kind of technology. There was a guy at Duke that was doing the study, and he had to use um, just uh, technology to be able to recreate what was there and to read the ink off the pages because if you touched it, it was so old it would just crumble and disintegrate. So you couldn't even touch it. Um, so um, that find is all of the buzz now in, in people that are into finding, you know, the truth of, of the scriptures. And it just validates. And it's really a big feather in the cap of, uh, of those who are uh, champions for the word of God is true. Uh, and it really just underlined uh, the validity of the word of God. So that, that built my faith. A lot saying, wow, that's 1970, but that's the most recent. They just recently were able to recreate uh, that and really exhume some of the information off those pages of the book of Leviticus. So, how exciting that is. Let's stand together tonight. I want us together to uh, thank the Lord for His Word. Uh, the book of Psalms says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. I don't know in the word of God where you'll find anything else that it says it will convert your soul we can entertain our soul with a lot of things but the word of God is the only thing that will convert the soul I thank God for what we are able to carry around day in day out in either written text or digital format and uh, I just want to thank the Lord for uh, the law of the Lord in our lives together tonight. Jesus, we, we come to the conclusion of our time together as your people, saved, purchased by your blood and filled with your spirit. And Lord, we've been converted by the word of God. Thank you for the word that has converted us, both the written and the spirit of the word. I thank you uh, and I pray, God, that you would allow this word to continue to become settled in our hearts, that it would convert our souls, that it would change and transform our lives. For the word of God is quick and it's powerful, Lord. You said it's sharper. You said, Lord, it can divide asunder of soul and spirit. It discerns thoughts and intents of our heart. God, I pray that you would release the power of your word in our life. And when we pick it up, when we, when we look at it, when we ingest it with our eyes, and let our souls, God, realize and hold it, God, as a priceless treasure that you have given to us and preserved it through thousands of years, God, so that we might hear the life-changing word of God. Thank you for the opportunity to be together. Thank you for the church of the living God. Be with us today. And be with us this weekend again for Friends Day. We pray this in the wonderful, precious name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you today. Thank you for being here.